There are a lot of drawing tablets out there, but which one is right for you? I've made that decision as easy as possible by creating a list of my top 10 drawing tablets to buy going into 2024. What sets this video apart from the other best tablet videos out there is that I actually own, have owned, or at least have tried nearly all of these tablets. So let's jump right into this review, starting with the least expensive tablets, and work our way up to the high-end tablets. This video is not sponsored, but Wacom did send me some of these tablets unconditionally to review as I please. The rest I received from viewers of my channel. As always, all opinions in this video are my own. Starting at number 10, we have the Wacom One Medium. This is the updated version released in 2023. The Wacom One is about as basic as it gets for drawing tablets. Although it lacks many of the advanced features of the other tablets in this list, it has all of the essentials you need to make digital art. You can draw on the tablet with a customizable pressure-sensitive pen with over 4,000 pressure levels. This pen even supports pen tilt, which gives you more control over the shape of your brush. For example, if you're drawing with a pencil, you can use tilt to angle your pencil to shade with the side of it. You can also angle flat or directional brushes. Several third-party EMR pens are also supported, like this Stadler Norris Digital Pencil and the Lamy All-Star Black EMR ink pen. The tablet surface has an active drawing area of 8.5 by 5.3 inches. There is a smaller version of the Wacom One, but I don't recommend purchasing a small tablet if you're going to be using it primarily for drawing or painting. A small tablet is okay for small gestures like you would use for photo editing or annotation, but it's much more comfortable to draw on a larger surface because you can use larger gestures. The Wacom One Medium does not offer a display you can draw onto. Instead, you have to draw on the tablet, which connects via USB or Bluetooth to your computer, and then you look at what you're drawing on your computer monitor. One of the best features of the Wacom One is that it's certified to work with Chromebooks. If you're looking for a low-budget digital art setup for yourself or your students, the Wacom One paired with a Chromebook is one of the cheapest options. You can even use Bluetooth to connect it to an Android smartphone or a small tablet, and it works pretty well. By installing the Wacom Center app, you can select a vertical portion of your device surface to draw on. This is far better than using your finger to draw. It's worth noting that you can purchase this tablet in retail stores and it will come with all of the necessary accessories. But if you use Wacom's website to order it, you'll need to be sure to select a pen and USB cable if you don't already have them. There is also the older version of this tablet known as One by Wacom, just to clear up any confusion about the names. We all have to start somewhere, so don't feel discouraged if you can only afford a basic tablet like this. The Wacom One is far better than any of my first drawing tablets. Even though the Wacom One is one of Wacom's most affordable tablets, it still offers the same top-notch drawing experience as the more expensive tablets that we'll look at in a bit. Number 9 is a small step up, and in some ways a step down. It's the Wacom Intuos medium version. The Intuos has an identical active drawing area and pressure levels as the Wacom One, but it also features four handy express keys which can be programmed to perform shortcuts. There are versions with and without Bluetooth. The Intuos is also certified to mostly work with Chromebooks, though we're still waiting for compatibility for the express keys. Just as well, you can connect the Intuos to select Android devices, but the Wacom Center app is not supported, so the experience is not very good. The Wacom One is much better for drawing on an Android device. And there is a tablet that is even more compatible with Android that is coming up later. Unfortunately, the Intuos does not support pen tilt. The Intuos Medium is pretty close in price to the Wacom One Medium, so you'll have to weigh whether the express keys and tilt recognition are worth it. In many respects, the Wacom One is better than this version of the Intuos. Though the Intuos has the edge in other ways. It's almost a tie in my opinion. Because it's been a while since Wacom updated the Intuos, it's possible they will update it in the near future and it will probably be better than the Wacom One, but that's just a guess. I know if I switch 9 and 10 around, that's exactly what would happen. My number 8 pick is the Wacom Intuos Pro 2nd generation medium or large. This is the Pro version of the Intuos with top of the line features and specs. At 8.7 by 5.8 inches, the Medium Intuos Pro is only slightly larger than the regular Intuos Medium, but the large Intuos Pro has a whopping active drawing area of 12.1 by 8.4 inches. 
Because it's pro, it's obviously more professional. It supports what I consider to be Wacom's best pen, the Pro Pen 2, which has over 8,000 pressure levels and can support pen tilt. The Intuos Pro also supports other types of Wacom pens like the Art Pen, which can sense barrel rotation. Pen tilt and rotation make a huge difference if you're a pro illustrator. There is a reason why flat brushes exist at the art store. On a side note, there is a newer Pro Pen 3, which is not compatible with anything other than the Cintiq Pro 27, 17, and 22. The Intuos Pro has a rougher surface compared to the smoother surface of the Intuos and Wacom 1. I personally prefer a surface with a bit of friction because it feels closer to drawing on paper, but it's not for everyone. Fortunately, you can change the feel of the pen and the surface of the tablet with optional nibs and surface textures. The Intuos Pro also offers eight express keys and a touch wheel. Plus it supports touch gestures, which can be used to pan and rotate your page and zoom in and out. The Intuos Pro can be connected with USB or wirelessly with Bluetooth. This is the end of the line for tablets without a display. From here on out, these tablets will all have built-in displays that you can draw directly onto. Coming in at number seven is the Wacom One, not to be confused with the Wacom One. Yeah, I know, it's not easy. This one is the Wacom One 13 Touch, and it was released alongside the other Wacom Ones in 2023. However, this one has a built-in display you can draw directly onto. The display quality on the Wacom One 13 is decent, but not on the level of the higher-end Cintiq Pros. It has a 1080p resolution, which is adequate, but not the most accurate color at around 76% of Adobe RGB. While there are advantages to drawing on a display, it's not essential. To be honest, you can make the same quality art on the Wacom One Medium, which doesn't have a screen. So don't feel like you need the most expensive tablet to be successful at digital art. Nevertheless, it does make it much, much easier to work on a tablet if it has a display, so I would highly recommend a display tablet if you can afford it. I ranked the Wacom One a bit higher than the Intuos Pro because I believe most artists are going to feel more comfortable drawing directly on a screen. But in many ways, the Wacom One is inferior to the Intuos Pro with only 4,000 pen pressure levels and a pen that is much more basic. It does support tilt, but does not have an eraser. Just like the other Wacom One tablets, the 13 supports additional pens, but only specific EMR pens, and unfortunately not any of Wacom's Pro pens. In addition, the Wacom One 13 is also compatible with Chromebooks. You should be able to get cursor movement, cursor visibility, pen pressure, and use of the pen buttons. The one feature that really sets the Wacom One 13 apart from the other tablets in this list is its ability to seamlessly connect to select Android devices to allow you to draw and paint with your phone or small tablet instead of a desktop or laptop. None of the other Android-compatible tablets do this nearly as well as the Wacom One 13 does. While the Intuos and Wacom One Medium can only map a portion of the tablet to your device's screen, the Wacom One 13 can open your phone full screen in desktop or dex mode. While you can do basic digital painting and drawing, making art on Android is not quite as robust as the experience you'd get by drawing on a Windows or Mac computer, though for some artists that may be all they need. Another distinct difference is that the Wacom 113 supports multi-touch, whereas the non-display versions of the Wacom One do not. This is particularly important if you're working on an Android device, since most Android apps require touch input. The Wacom 113 has an active drawing area of 11.6 by 6.5 inches, which is considerably larger than the Intuos Pro Medium, but only a bit narrower than the Intuos Pro Large and not as tall. Because of this taller aspect ratio, the large Intuos Pro lends itself better to large gesture drawing. Another notable difference is that because the Wacom 113 is a display tablet, you will need to connect it to your device with video and power cables in addition to the USB cable needed to transmit data. Although, if your computer has a USB-C port that supports displays and can power a device, you can do it all with a single USB-C cable. The Intuos Pro has a slight advantage because it can also be connected wirelessly with Bluetooth. While you can purchase the Wacom 113 retail and it will come with a pen and cables, you can customize it online at wacom.com. This makes the price comparisons a little tricky because the cheapest customization differs from the most expensive one by almost $150. The Intuos Pro and the Cintiq 16, which we'll look at later, are the closest in price to the Wacom 113. It might be worth it to choose the Wacom 113 depending on your needs. 
I think if you lean toward professional, you may prefer the Intuos Pro Large or the Cintiq 16 since they offer a better pen and larger gesture space. But if you're more of a beginner or a hobbyist, then the Wacom 113 might be more than adequate. There is even a more affordable 12-inch version of the Wacom 1 with the same specs as the 13, but it does not support multi-touch. I think multi-touch is a benefit when working on a display tablet, so I prefer the Wacom 113. Number 6 is another pair of display tablets that share nearly the same specs but come in different sizes, the Wacom Cintiq 16 and the Cintiq 22. Aside from the size, the most notable distinction is that the Cintiq 22 comes with a stand, whereas the Cintiq 16 has fold-out legs with an optional stand that must be purchased separately for $80. Both sizes of this tablet are great, but as you know, I prefer a large drawing surface, so choose the 22 if you can afford it. These displays have a resolution of 1080p and support around 70% of the Adobe RGB color gamut. If you're trying to decide between the Cintiq 16 or the Wacom 113, if you lean professional, go with the Cintiq 16 because it comes with the more comfortable ProPen 2 with twice as many pressure levels and an eraser. The Cintiq 16 also supports Wacom's other ProPens, and it has an optional adjustable stand, which I definitely recommend if you want to work at a more vertical angle. The Wacom 113 only offers a little puck that breaks in two and you rest your tablet against it. It's not nearly as stable or versatile as the Cintiq 16 stand, which attaches to the tablet. While the Wacom 113 can be connected with a single USB-C cable, if your computer supports it, the Cintiqs require an HDMI video connection to a Mac or Windows computer, in addition to a USB-A cable and power. The Wacom 113 and the Intuos Pro are definitely the thinner, lighter, more portable options. But if that doesn't matter, then the Cintiq 16 is what I would choose, considering the prices of all these are fairly close to each other. Now here's where we start to transition to tablets that are more for professional use. These tablets offer features that are probably only going to matter to artists who make art for a living, such as screen resolution and color accuracy. Even if these models are out of your price range, I think it's still helpful to see what they offer to give you a better idea of what you should expect from the more affordable tablets. Moving on to number 5, I have chosen another pair of tablets, the Wacom Mobile Studio Pro 13 and 16 second generation. The Mobile Studio Pro is essentially a Cintiq Pro that has been combined with a computer. Unlike the other display tablets in my list, the Mobile Studio Pro is the only model that does not require a connection to a separate device like a laptop, desktop, or Android device. The Mobile Studio Pro 16 runs on Windows 10 or 11, which means it can run any application that is supported by Windows. Not light versions of desktop apps, not mobile apps, this is the full version of Photoshop running here. The Mobile Studio Pro is also battery powered, which makes it perfect for artists who like to work outside the studio. I absolutely love it for painting outdoors or while traveling. The Mobile Studio Pro 13 has a WQHD screen resolution, which is better than the 1920x1080 supported by the Wacom 1, Cintiq 16, and Cintiq 22, but not as crisp as the UHD resolution supported by many of the other high-end tablets. The 16-inch version of the Mobile Studio Pro does support UHD resolution, but it does not have very accurate color at only 85% of Adobe RGB. The Mobile Studio Pro 13 is even more subpar with only 82% Adobe RGB coverage. The Mobile Studio Pro is equipped with three USB-C ports and can also be connected as a regular Cintiq to a Windows or Mac computer. Similar in design to the Intuos Pro, the Mobile Studio Pro has either six or eight express keys and a touch wheel. One feature that sets the Mobile Studio Pro apart from most other tablets is that it can sense screen rotation using the accelerometer. You can use this to change the angle of dripping paint on your canvas and rebel. The most significant consideration about this device is its obsolescence. The last iteration of this device came out in 2019, so there's also the risk when buying this that a new model could be released with significantly better hardware. This is the only type of tablet that does not age well. The other devices in this review shouldn't need to be replaced for a long time because they can accommodate multiple computers. As of 2019, the hardware in the Mobile Studio Pro is very outdated. You can upgrade the RAM and SSD, but that's not enough to handle the most demanding art apps like Photoshop, Corel Painter, Krita, or Rebel. Mobile optimized apps are a different story. Those run fairly well. Even with top of the line specs, tablets and laptops use mobile processors which prefer power saving over performance. 
A powerful desktop is always going to provide the snappiest performance, and if that's what you're used to, then the Mobile Studio Pro will definitely feel sluggish in comparison. Still, the Mobile Studio Pro 16 is the best mobile painting device on the market. You can't beat the portability, the drawing experience is as good as the high-end Cintiq Pros, full Windows apps are supported, and I can seamlessly move files from my Mobile Studio Pro to my desktop and continue to work on them. You're trading performance for portability with this device, so if you don't need to make your studio mobile, then I'd get something else. It's worth noting that the Mobile Studio Pro 13 has been discontinued, but you can still find them used. My number four choice is the Wacom Cintiq Pro 16 second generation. As with the Pro and non-Pro models of the Intuos, this is the full-featured counterpart of the stripped-down Cintiq 16. It's worth noting that this is the newer iteration released in 2021, not the first-generation Cintiq Pro 16, which also came in a 13-inch size. The Pro Cintiqs are much higher quality with UHD displays. That's roughly four times the resolution of the lower-end Cintiqs. They use etched glass that is bonded closely to the display, so there is virtually no parallax. The Cintiq Pro 16 supports 98% of Adobe RGB, which is very accurate color, but it can only utilize 8 bits rather than 10. The most unique thing about this tablet used to be the express keys on the back, but it appears that this is a direction Wacom is going with other devices as well. The Cintiq Pro 16 has folding legs and VESA mounting holes on the back. If you're going to be using this tablet a lot, I'd highly recommend mounting it to a monitor arm or a stand. Hunching over your tablet is only going to destroy your back. The Cintiq 22 is slightly cheaper than the Cintiq Pro 16, and although it lacks the Pro features, the larger display and adjustable stand might make it more comfortable to draw on if resolution and color accuracy are not that important to you. Another notable comparison is that the Wacom 113 is capable of using a single USB-C cable, if your computer supports it, which is more convenient than the HDMI, USB, and power cables that are required for the Cintiq Pro 16. Although not as thin as the Wacom 113, the Cintiq Pro 16 is one of Wacom's thinnest display tablets and could easily be transported around. In third place is another pair, the Wacom Cintiq Pro 24 and 32. The massive active drawing areas of the Cintiq Pro 24 and 32 give you plenty of room for your application interface, while keeping your canvas wide enough so that you can make very large gestures while drawing or painting. I'd say from this point in the review forward, if you want the best digital art experience money can buy, these high-end Cintiqs are where it's at. It feels great to be able to work on a large image on a large screen and see every detail without having to zoom in. And if you do need to zoom, pan, or rotate, the Cintiq Pro 24 and 32 support multi-touch, though there is a non-touch version of the 24 that is a bit cheaper. Both devices support the Pro Pen 2 and have a UHD screen resolution. The color accuracy on the Cintiq Pro 24 is 99% of Adobe RGB, which is as good as it gets. The Cintiq Pro 32 offers 98% Adobe RGB coverage, but 1% is not that significant of a difference. Unlike the Cintiq Pro 16, which only supports 8-bit color, these devices and all of the Cintiqs from here forward support 10-bit color. That means it can display billions of colors rather than millions of colors if your GPU and software support it. Rather than external buttons like those found on the Cintiq Pro 16, the Cintiq Pro 24 and 32 come with an express key remote which magnetically sticks to the bezel. They also have folding legs like the smaller Cintiq Pro 16, but unfortunately they do not come with VESA holes. However, you can buy an optional bracket that will allow you to use VESA mounts. There is also an official Wacom Ergo stand, and then there's the Wacom branded Flex Ergotron arm. I'd say a stand is essential for either of these tablets because they are so large. Another notable difference is that the Cintiq Pro 24 and 32 feature USB ports on the side, as well as an SD card reader, headphone jack, and mic. In terms of portability, these are some pretty bulky devices. They require a lot of desk space, and they aren't that convenient to lug around. Technically, these are portable in the sense that there is an optional computer module with outdated hardware that you can add to the Cintiq Pro 24 and 32 called the Cintiq Pro Engine. This will allow you to turn your Cintiq Pro into a fully functional computer. But it's not as portable as the self-powered Mobile Studio Pro would be, because you'd have to lug around a large Cintiq, plus find outlets to power the device. Affordability-wise, these tablets are overkill for a beginner or hobbyist. 
If you just want a big screen to draw on, you might be comfortable with a Cintiq 22 since it includes the stand and does basically the same thing as the Cintiq Pro. It's worth noting that the 32 has been discontinued, so you'll have to find it used. My main gripe about the Cintiq Pro 24 and 32 are the sizes. I think 24 inches is too small and 32 is too large. The 32 really takes up a lot of desk space and requires you to move your arm a lot. In my opinion, 27 inches is the sweet spot of display size. In a very close second place is the most recent Wacom tablet, the Cintiq Pro 27. There are a lot of things that should easily make this the number one tablet on my list, but the few somewhat minor issues I have with it make it difficult for me to say that I'd prefer it over my number one pick. First, let me share what's good about this tablet. The newest Cintiq Pro is the only Wacom display tablet line with a refresh rate of 120Hz. All other tablets are half as fast. A faster refresh rate allows the display to react more quickly to your pen input. For instance, the mouse cursor movement and brush cursor will appear more fluid rather than choppy. Scrolling and other types of quick movement are also noticeably faster. Artists will appreciate the faster refresh rate when doing zigzag shading and other repetitive quick gestures like hatching. I like that it makes recordings of my display clearer by removing the strobing effect I get when my camera is out of sync. The Cintiq Pro 27 supports HDR, 99% of Adobe RGB, 98% of DCI P3, and it's Pantone and Pantone Skin Tone validated. Some other things I like about it are the pen holder, which can be attached in various positions, the environmentally conscious packing and construction that uses recycled plastic, and in many cases no plastic at all. For instance, there are no plastic baggies or zip ties, only paper holding the accessories. And I like the quarter inch mounting holes that you can use to attach a webcam. Compared to the Cintiq Pro 24 and 32, the 27 inch model is slimmer. The design is radically different with a more rectangular form that isn't as sloping as the other Cintiq Pros. But that's not all that's been taken away. The bezel is significantly thinner on the Cintiq Pro 27. Too thin in my opinion, since I like having that buffer zone for my hand and pen. Unlike the other Cintiq Pros, there are no folding legs on this device, but there are VESA holes and you can use them to attach the optional $500 Wacom Ergo stand, a monitor arm, or the Zoot Pro. Gone are the side USB ports you can use to connect peripherals. However, you can utilize two USB ports on the back, Though it's not advertised, these do work. Wacom also took away the useful SD card slot, and while I don't use them, the headphone jack and the mic are gone too. The docking area for the Express Key remote is no more, but there are now eight physical Express Keys on the back in a grip orientation. Rather than a Windows-based menu to control the display settings, you now have to navigate with the Express Keys through a menu built into the device. The newer ProPen 3 has less features as well, it's missing an eraser, is easily broken, and the build quality feels very entry level. Fortunately, the Pro Pen 2 still works. And worst of all, the low fan noise option that greatly improves the usability of the Cintiq Pro 16, 24, and 32 is nowhere to be found for the Cintiq Pro 27. Instead, we are stuck with noisy fans that ruin audio recordings and create a distraction. While I could probably overcome most of my complaints about this device, the fan noise is the deal breaker. As a content creator, I record audio almost daily, so I can't stand for unnecessary noise in my studio. Many older Cintiqs are silent, so why are these newer ones not? I really hope that a firmware update fixes the fan noise issue. If it did, I think the Cintiq Pro 27 would probably pull ahead of my number one pick. I also want to mention that Wacom recently released a 17 and 22 inch version of the Cintiq Pro, which has the same specs, but in smaller sizes. The most notable distinction is that the Cintiq Pro 17 comes with an easy stand offering a fixed angle. The 22 and 27 do not come with a stand. The 17 also comes with fewer cables, so if you want to connect the display with HDMI or DisplayPort, you'll need one of those cables. If you already have these cables, there's a good chance they will work since a proprietary cable is not required. Before I share my number one choice, please consider becoming a member to help me keep this channel going. You can sign up for as little as 99 cents or choose a custom amount. I did not get paid to make this video. I make these videos to help people like you get into digital art and have success with it. But it's also my full-time job, not a hobby, so I have to generate income. 
I have recently chosen to no longer show ads on my new videos, which is better for my viewers, but has significantly reduced my income. In order to continue creating reviews, I am relying on support from members, sales of my digital art products, and commissions from affiliate links. So I hope you'll consider the value you have been getting out of these videos and support me as I move away from ad revenue and towards a more sustainable future where fans support the content they enjoy. Okay, now for my number one drawing tablet. Still topping the list at number one is the Wacom Cintiq 27 QHD Touch. This is probably a surprise to some of you, but I actually feel more comfortable working on the Cintiq 27 QHD compared to the newer Cintiq Pro 27. At the end of the day, enjoying digital art isn't about having the newest or most expensive tablet. It's about having the one that is best for you. Sure, I like that the Cintiq Pro 27 has a much better display, but I don't like that so many useful features were removed. I can live with a QHD resolution and only 2000 pressure levels. That's not going to hold me back enough to deal with fan noise while I work. The one thing that I really would benefit from is the 120Hz refresh rate, which would make for better recordings of my screen, but oh well. While the other Cintiq Pros have a contrast ratio of 1000 to 1, the Cintiq 27 QHD only has 970 to 1, which means the range of contrast is slightly greater on the newer devices. Just like the Cintiq Pros, an optional stand is available which does not support rotation. Or you can purchase an inexpensive VESA adapter and connect a monitor arm or Zoot Pro which do support rotation. The Cintiq 27 QHD also comes with the Express Key remote. I prefer this over the Express Keys being on the back of the display. Since they are selling for under $1000 used, I'd say if you can find a Cintiq 27 QHD touch in working condition, snatch it up. Even the non-touch version would be great if you don't think you'll need touch. If you can't find a Cintiq 27 QHD, honestly, any of the Cintiq Pro tablets are excellent choices if you're looking for the best tablet. All right, that was my list of the top 10 drawing tablets to buy in 2024. I'm certain other tablets will be released later in 2024 that will change my list, and when that happens, I will update this video. Otherwise, this list will continue to be accurate. I will also mention that the online market is heavily saturated with poor quality Wacom imitations. Others, like the iPad Pro and the Microsoft Surface, are okay, but there are a lot of factors that hold them back and they are not very budget friendly. I want you to be successful with digital art, and I don't want you to waste your time or money, so if it feels like I excluded a lot of brands from this list, I did. Only tablets I would recommend to friends and family made it onto this list. I have a convenient page where you can view and purchase these tablets on my website at aaronrutten.com. I can earn commissions from your purchase without costing you anything extra. This income helps me continue making reviews for you, so please use my affiliate links if you're going to purchase any of these devices. And if you'd like to watch in-depth reviews of the tablets featured in this video, check out my review playlists. Rather than subscribe to my channel, join my free Patreon for notifications that are more reliable. I announce my new videos there as well. I'll link you to all of that in the description of this video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.